It's my... Hi, my name's uh, Bob Westervelt, um, and it's a pleasure to introduce Claire Legal from uh, Cavendish Laboratory today. Uh, courtesy of the internet, we have the ability to really get top people uh, speak to us from Europe without flying across the ocean twice, which is big advantage in terms of uh, lining up uh, the talks. Um, Claire uh, is an expert in qubits. Uh, she got her uh, PhD in condensed matter physics from the Univers Université Joseph Fourier in Grenoble in France, and then worked at, went to work with uh, Mette Atatouré at uh, Cambridge uh, Laboratory as a research associate. Um, she was awarded a, a Dorothy uh, Hodgkin Royal Society Fellowship in uh, 2008, which she is currently uh, enjoying. Um, a big uh, problem uh, for making quantum systems is really getting a quantum memory, that is a memory that remembers the phase as well as the uh, plus or minus aspect of the, the qubit. Uh, but there are a lot of things that one can do with that when it works, for example, as we're talking about making a, a quantum network to transmit qubits from one place to another. Um, and so today, uh, Claire will be uh, telling us about uh, one approach of doing that. Thanks very much for, uh, for coming here. Thank you very much, Bob, for the kind introduction. And so today, um, I'm going to tell you about collective phenomena in a nuclear spin ensemble, um, progress and, and prospects. And the picture you see in the background kind of encapsulates uh, the, the system um, that uh, we are working with, which comprises a single electron spin qubit uh, that we can control uh, very well, very precisely uh, with light pulses. And uh, this electron, this electron spin actually has a wave function spread over thousands of uh, nuclear spins. And it thus couples fairly homogeneously to this uh, spin ensemble. And, and this means that we have, uh, using quantum dots, a natural platform uh, that allows us to talk uh, to a spin ensemble uh, as a whole and, um, and to study uh, collective phenomena um, in, in the studied state. And so, Oh, all right, okay. And so um, the motivation behind sort of why we started to, to um, look um, at this nuclear spin ensemble beyond, um, you know, sheer curiosity is also that nuclear spins in general, uh, as, as Bob already said, are, are a natural quantum resource uh, for quantum communication. And so if you think about quantum communication, you can sort of separate um, the approaches in, in kind of what I'll call the hybrid approach, which is based on um, uh, matter quantum memory, um, which can be interfaced with a flying qubit. So typically that's also called a spin photon interface. You have a matter qubit whose states you can control and measure with, with high efficiency. And this quantum state uh, can uh, ideally fully coherently and with high efficiency be uh, mapped onto a photon, which is now your, your flying qubit, and can travel over large distances to sort of uh, create these uh, distributed quantum architectures. Um, and that's an approach that has been around, um, I would say, since uh, 2000. And a competing approach, which is emerging more recently, is uh, the so-called all-photonic uh, approach, which is based on uh, entangled states of photons. But really, if you think about these entangled states of photons, the way to create them actually still involves um, this spin photon interface um, because, because spin and the control you have over, over a spin state is a natural way to generate um, entanglement between, between su successively emitted photons. 
And nuclear spins in that picture, they're kind of a dark spin, uh, which is this extra resource uh, that can be used to build um, a quantum repeater in a scalable way, um, in, in the case of the hybrid approach. But also, actually, it turns out that the, this uh, nuclear spin resource is the same one that allows you to build an all photonic quantum repeater state. So in many ways, uh, nuclear spin, which whichever approach you're looking at, are, are really um, useful. And there are many uh, solid state uh, system, um, which people are, are, are considering to serve as um, network nodes. Um, one of the most mature um, platforms are semiconductor quantum dots. They're the ones I'll be talking um, to you about today. Uh, but of course, there are more recent platform which uh, by now have emerged as um, more mature platforms in terms of advancing the, the field of, of quantum networks. And that is, of course, the NV Center uh, in Diamond, where uh, a quantum repeater protocol has been uh, demonstrated, as well as a three node quantum network. Um, of course, Diamond has its issue as a material and people are also interested, for example, in vacancy complexes in silicon carbide, um, because it's a material where it's easier to engineer your defect in, in a nanophotonic structure, for example, that's one, one advantage. You have also um, um, less interaction with uh, phonons when you try to do um, this coherent transfer from spin state to, to photon, to flying qubit. And um, another uh, platform which uh, um, people have really like taken to, to great um, lengths recently is a uh, single rare earth ions um, where a lot of the sort of elementary uh, building blocks um, for, for, for a quantum networks have, have been um, demonstrated. Um, but today I will focus on semiconductor quantum dots. And really the advantage of, a, of this platform over other platform is simply that it has the best uh, quantum optical properties. Um, so what, what I mean is optical properties if you look at quantum applications. Uh, so photon indistinguishability, uh, photon rate, uh, if it, quantum efficiency, so fairly weak interaction with, with phonons, etc. And some detractors of, of this platform will say that quantum dots also have the worst spin properties. But um, today I hope that I convince you uh, that it's something we are working on and really um, making fast progress on. And the specificity of, of um, this platform, I have, as I have already said on my intro slide, is really um, this homogeneous coupling of the electron to, to a nuclear spin ensemble. Um, but I might need to uh, sort of uh, cross-check my originality because actually it turns out that uh, in rare earth ions, for example, um, a uh, smaller uh, nuclear spin ensemble um, of, of four vanadium spins couple also homogeneously. So we, there is also another system that has been recently established as, um, as a, um, a platform where you have, uh, you know, an, a natural um, storage into collective states uh, of a nuclear spin ensemble. And I really uh, recommend you check this uh, paper from the Ferran group uh, party. But today um, I will focus on, on this system. So what is um, a quantum dot? A quantum dot is basically a nanometer size inclusion of a low band gap semiconductor um, within a, a band gap, uh, a larger band gap semiconductor. And the, effect of that is, is really that um, the, the quantum dot is sort of a 3D uh, potential well 
for electron and holes in, in uh, the semiconductor. And so these um, um, electron and holes acquire, um, you know, atomic-like discrete uh, energy levels, uh, just, just like in an atom, hence um, the, the nickname, quantum not nickname of artificial atom. And, um, sorry. and with very um, high quantum efficiency, you can sort of address um, these, um, uh, re you can address resonantly very coherent optical transitions, um, be typically between the, the ground state um, of, of the quantum dot. Um, and yeah, um, and so further, something that you know is is now becoming standard in um, in the quantum dot field is to actually control the charge state of the quantum dot. So, in other words, to deterministically go from an artificial atom to an artificial ion. Um, the way we do that is what that we embed uh, these quantum dots in a PIN diode, where the quantum dots are actually fairly close, uh, tens of nanometers away from a Fermi C of, uh, of electron. And so by controlling the voltage across uh, the diode, you can actually control the charge state of uh, the quantum dots. So that's a technique um, established since uh, 2000. Um, sorry, I just wanted to uh, show here as well this um, and point out on this picture of like a typical quantum dot device, um, which is, uh, you know, one, one that we use in our lab. Uh, the use as well of a solid immersion lens to, to enhance uh, collection efficiencies in, in all our experiments. Um, so what is like the thing to know about um, about the electron quantum, um, the electron uh, energy levels. So a quantum dot charged with a single electron essentially has two um, spin states uh, corresponding to the electron spin up or spin down. And these ground states couple uh, to optically excited states, so with an added electron hole pair. Um, and typically for um, in all our experiments, we apply a transverse uh, magnetic field, transverse to the growth axis, to split our energy levels, which gives rise to um, these uh, lambda levels uh, between the ground state and any of the two optically excited states. Um, now, this, uh, these lambda transitions means that we can uh, uh, fairly quickly initialize our spin qubit. We just need to, for instance, shine a laser resonantly here to uh, optically pump our electron in the spin up state. And we can also create and measure any quantum superposition uh, using a two photon uh, Raman resonance. And so um, to show you what spin control looks like, this is uh, the evolution of the spin-up population uh, as I turn on a two-photon Raman drive, and you see these coherent Rabi oscillations between the spin-up and spin-down state. And as you increase your laser power, you can actually um, decrease your, your typical gate times um, with operation speeds you know, as low as you wish, and typically reaching uh, 200 megahertz. So this is very much like standard uh, ESR, uh, electron spin resonance control techniques, uh, just via an optical field. And we can, in fact, um, do more fancy phase modulation of this optical field to do multi-axis uh, spin control sequences. Now, this electron spin, which constitutes our well-controlled simple quantum system, uh, couples coherently via the hyperfine interaction uh, to a nuclear spin ensemble. And for us, that's really the, the interesting many-body quantum system. 
Now, until uh, 2017, I'd say, um, for, for everyone, um, every experimentalist, this nuclear spin ensemble was essentially a classical source of noise. Because um, your nuclear spins at, you know, 4 Kelvin, which is uh, the temperature we work at, that's, that 4 Kelvin is actually infinite temperature uh, for, for nuclear spins. And so um, the, the nuclear spin polarization is uh, completely random. And in fact, if you have N nuclear spins, you typically have a root N uncertainty on your nuclear spin polarization and a broadening of your electron uh, resonance, which is A, the hyperfine um, coupling constant times root N on the order of 100 megahertz. But then if you look at the theory, uh, something that's been long proposed is, is that um, these nuclear spins can be used as, as a robust quantum memory. And so the, the um, idea here is that we're gonna take our electron uh, as a control and a probe of this complex quantum system and um, try to understand, um, you know, what, what kind of collective phenomena we can see and if we can use them for, for uh, quantum storage. And so just, you know, to sort of give you a picture you're kind of used to, um, if you have an atomic system and you have a hyperfine coupling, you have these hyperfine spin states. And in the case of, of a quantum dot, you know, you have two to the power n hyperfine states where n is 10 to the five. So that's kind of the challenge here is, is the sheer number, the sheer size of, of your Hilbert space when, when you wanna control um, these uh, you know, collective nuclear states. So to give you um, sort of um, a more simplified picture of our energy levels, uh, I'm drawing here um, the eigenstates uh, in the presence of a strong uh, magnetic field along the z-axis. So we, if we have that, um, what happens is that uh, our energy levels look essentially like a ladder of states. Uh, so here, um, you know, from top to bottom, I'm just flipping the electron spin. Oops, sorry. I'm just flipping the electron spin. And that costs me an energy, which is the electron Zeeman energy, plus uh, the hyperfine shift, which is um, AZ, the, the nuclear hyperfine times IZ, the, the uh, nuclear polarization. And from uh, left to right here, I'm changing um, the, the quantum number IZ, which is you know, the total uh, polarization of the nuclear spin ensemble. And um, when you do that, the energy cost to provide to the system is the nuclear Zeeman energy minus or plus the hyperfine constant AZ, which is on the order of a megahertz. This is tens of megahertz. This, this is of order megahertz. And so really, if you're targeting to um, control um, the nuclear collective states, you know, one thing you want to be able to do is resolve this central transition, which corresponds to simply coherently flipping the electron spin without touching the nuclear spin state. So that's your standard ESR to these uh, sideband transition, which allow you to flip um, the nuclear spin state. And at 4 Kelvin, um, as we discussed, the, the um, uncertainty on um, this nuclear polarization, IZ, leads to um, a frequency shift of 100 megahertz, which is much, much larger than the nuclear Zeeman energy. So one way to see this is that your thermal state is not sideband resolved. You're not gonna be able to uh, resolve resolve this, um, this energy. And so that's why the, the first thing that uh, we have been working on in, in all these experiments is actually 
entering the sideband resolve regime with what's called in the field uh, nuclear state narrowing. And the way we've implemented it really is um, using, uh, you know, a cooling scheme, which is pretty much exactly the same as in atomic physics, which is called Raman cooling. I won't discuss it in uh, a lot of details, but I will just show you the effect on the electron spin resonance. So this red curve here shows you the electron spin resonance when we haven't cooled the nuclear spin ensemble, and it's fairly broad, as we, as we have said. And once we apply this sort of um, Raman cooling scheme, which really allows us to um, uh, prepare the nuclear state in a, a well-controlled IZ state. We drop down the uncertainty on IZ down to five megahertz, which is now much smaller uh, than the nuclear Zeeman energy. So we're entering um, this, this sideband resolved uh, regime. And so the next question is, can we control uh, QD nuclear states via, via the electron? So to do this, we um, use our, uh, you know, very weak frequency selective drive um, that we shine for a certain duration, either uh, at zero detuning delta equals zero here, which would address here the central transition, but we can also scan um, this uh, detuning here and observe what happens. So the, on this 2D map here, you observe um, the signal corresponding to the electron spin state population for different detuning as a function of drive time. And if you take um, a line cut of this data at a short drive time here, the only thing you see um, in the signal is this blue curve here, which is, um, the central transition corresponding to flipping the electron spin. Um, the, the red curve here for reference is, is a thermal nuclear state. Now, as you increase the drive time, um, what you see is the appearance of uh, sideband processes. And these sideband processes are in fact exactly detuned from your central uh, electron spin resonance by once or twice uh, the nuclear Zeeman energy. And you see them appear uh, very clearly at these long drive times uh, as, as this, uh, you know, the, the strength of this transition is weaker. So the reason why we can flip the nuclear spin by one or two units, you know, once the Zeeman or twice the nuclear Zeeman energy, really comes um, from the microscopic origin of the sideband transition. I won't discuss it in a lot of detail, uh, but just for, you know, people who are familiar with spin physics, um, these uh, transition are really kind of linked to, um, to the interplay of quadrupolar interaction, nuclear quadrupolar interactions, and uh, the electron nuclear hyperfine. And so um, you can see that by modulating SZ, the, the, the electron polarization at the nuclear Zeeman energy, we can flip uh, via this IX operator, uh, the nuclear polarization by one unit, or uh, by two units uh, if we have this Ix square term. And this quadratic, um, you know, the, the quadratic origin of, of, of these operators com comes from the quadrupolar interaction. Um, and so once we uh, saw these sidebands, the next thing we went on to try was um, to see if we could actually drive uh, these sideband transitions coherently. Um, and so if, for, for that purpose, we really, um, you know, tried pretty much all possible uh, um, uh, drive uh, Rabi frequencies. And uh, what we saw is uh, 
a Goldilocks region between you know, 9 and, and uh, 14 megahertz, roughly, where, where you see these coherent uh, oscillations um, of, of electron spin population, which are linked to driving this sideband transition coherently. And why this Goldilocks region? If, if your drive is, is too slow, uh, dephasing kind of takes over. And if your drive is, is too strong, um, you end up not being able to, to have the spectral uh, selectivity to, to drive the sideman process coherently. Um, but the next thing, you know, having sort of inferred um, the fact that we could launch these collective uh, spin excitations in the nuclear ensemble through the electron population, the next thing we set out to, to, to demonstrate is that we could actually directly detect um, these collective excitation as a change of nuclear spin polarization. And I will just show um, this, this one slide on this result, but if, if you want um, you know, to, to, to know more, uh, have, have a look at um, this, this paper. Um, but I, I want to here just give you a, a, an idea of, of uh, how, how we perform that. So the idea again is to prepare the nuclear ensemble in this um, narrowed nuclear spin state and to drive uh, a nuclear um, uh, spin wave, a collective excitation in the ensemble. And then we sort of flank this drive uh, sequence with uh, Ramsey measurements before and after we inject this nuclear magnon, this nuclear spin wave. What this Ramsey measurement allows us to do is to have an ultra precise measurement of the electron spin splitting. And the electron spin splitting, as we have seen already, is actually dependent on the nuclear polarization IZ. And so what um, our signal shows, so if you look here on this bottom panel where we sh um, show the differential shift, so the, the difference um, between the diff uh, yeah, the difference between our two Ramsey measurements, we observe that as a function of detuning, we detect a positive shift when we drive um, uh, when, when we're at positive detuning, so when we um, polarize the nuclear spin ensemble up and a negative shift at negative detuning. So we, we are able to um, detect the polarity uh, of our spin wave and this polarity exactly fits uh, the nuclear spin flipping process we had in mind, reading just, just the electron spin um, population. And this electron spin population, just to remind you, is how what we measured right after the drive. It's actually um, the, the pink uh, data here. And the bonus for us, really what excited us, is um, that on top of being able to res resolve the polarity, we could also see, um, particularly within this second sideband, the, the spectral uh, resolution of the two different nuclear spin species, arsenic and indium, which are at uh, slightly different nuclear Zeeman energies. Right, and again, if you um, yeah, want to know more on, on this um, quantum sensing experiments, please um, do have a look at, at this paper. But today, I would like to spend a bit more time on explaining also how um, we can use these collective excitations to probe uh, the nuclear state. And a simple question that I want to, to ask is how to measure uh, nuclear polarization. Now, we've seen already with our quantum sensing experiment that one way to measure the nuclear polarization is simply to measure um, this 
um, shift um, that is due to the, the nuclear polarization, this shift on the electron spin resonance, right? And that's one way. But equipped with uh, collective spin waves, there is a, non, a second way, which is uh, the measure of sideband asymmetry. So if you consider that um, you start from a given uh, electron nuclear state and you inject uh, a spin wave which increases the nuclear polarization, you expect the um, Rabi frequency of this process to be proportional to the square root of n down, n down being the number of nuclei which are available to spin flip and, and allow you to go from Iz to Iz plus one. On the other hand, for a polarization decreasing process, you expect um, to be proportional to square root of n up. And so in other words, by measuring uh, this quantity, which is you know, the square of omega minus, um, minus omega plus square over the sum, you can directly obtain the fractional polarization of the nuclear ensemble, n up minus n down over n. And the remarkable thing of this measure is that it's actually agnostic. You don't need to calculate this nuclear polarization, any information on the hyperfine constant of the material. That might seem a bit of an academic problem because the hyperfine constant of the materials are fairly well known, but still it's kind of a remarkable um, uh, property of these nuclear spin waves. So that's kind of what we set out to do. And so to do that, we want to prepare a polarized nuclear ensemble. Obviously, we want to be able to inject spin waves. So we will need to, to prepare it in a narrowed nuclear spin state to be able to be in the sideband resolved regime. And beyond that, um, we are going to prepare this, this set polarization by slowly ramping uh, our two photon Raman laser detuning, which has the effect of shifting, uh, shifting slowly the lock point of, of um, the sort of autonomous optical feedback that we, we implement on the nuclear ensemble. And, and the goal is thus to have a reduced variance state at any given polarization. So this is a 2D map uh, showing you the range of nuclear polarization that we were able to achieve, uh, or I should say over Hauser shift. So by how much we have increased or decreased the electron Zeeman splitting um, due to nuclear polarization. And so on top of sort of the 25 gigahertz uh, Lama frequency of the electron, you can see that we can um, shift via uh, nuclear polarization effect this, um, this frequency by tens of gigahertz. And um, at this, for each of these set uh, nuclear polarization, we scanned our Raman detuning to be able to record a sideband spectrum. And I have highlighted on this map the central ESR peak which is again flanked by these uh, sideband nuclear spin flipping sideband transition. And you can already see on this 2D map how at positive nuclear polarization, this sideband becomes uh, a stronger in intensity than uh, this sideband process. And, and the reverse is true at negative polarizations. But in fact, in our system, um, contrary to the simple example I, I gave two slides ago, we don't have a spin one half system. We have these strain um, enabled uh, spin wave modes, uh, which allow um, 
to to flip uh, in the to, to flip a nuclear spin uh, within different sort of magnetic sublevels. So we have spin three halves, and for instance, if you want to um, flip um, the the nucle a nuclear spin by two units, there are two possibilities. Either your nuclear spin is initially in the pre plus three half state, or it's initially in the plus one half state. All all these processes uh, are allowed by by uh, our Hamiltonian, and so as a result, the selection rules um, as a result of these selection rules in the single particle picture, the sideband strength is in fact not only proportional to a square root n factor, but it is in fact giving us information about um, the spin population in the single particle basis. And so this means that we can use the, the strength of these four sidebands to fully reconstruct the spin imbalance within the three half spin manifold or the minus uh, the one half uh, imbalance in this one half manifold. And something which is quite interesting is that compared to sort of um, a standard um, nuclear spin polarization where you would uh, stay in a thermal state, that's sort of the dash um, the dashed line here on this top and bottom graph. Here, what we observe is that particularly in the one half manifold, we observe that the spin um, population goes against the nuclear polarization that we create, right? We polarize our spin states, uh, our nuclear spins up, and somehow the population of the plus one half is lower than the minus one half. And this is in fact something we understand very well from um, our um, sort of feedback model, which is um, the black curve here. And it's really coming only from the fact that our nuclear spin feedback also relies on these um, sideband transitions. And in particular, the first sidebands, which are, um, you know, the, the pink arrows here, um, if you try to polarize your nuclear spin up, they will deplete the plus one half spin state and deplete the minus three half spin state. And depleting the plus one half spin state is, is responsible for creating this counterintuitive uh, imbalance. But something even more interesting uh, happens if you um, look at the total uh, nuclear spin polarization. So we can, um, with this data, reconstruct uh, the nuclear polarization, which is uh, a species resolved nuclear spin polarization for both arsenic and indium. And we can estimate uh, the gallium uh, polarization. Uh, which contributes less to the overhauser shift, but yet. But if we sum all these nuclear polarization measured via the, the sideband asymmetry, something interesting happens. The um, nuclear polarization that we measure via the sideband asymmetry is roughly twice the one that we see if we measure the electron spin splitting. So there's, there's a, this discrepancy which is larger than a factor two. And the question is why? And the answer is actually that you have to look into, you know, the, the collective states uh, of the collective yeah, states of, of your nuclear spin ensemble. If you take an ensemble with n nuclear spins, um, the, the, and, and you interact with it via these collective spin wave modes, uh, the correct quantum number to consider is the total angular momentum. And if you have a collection of spins and you add, um, the, the, add them to create a total angular momentum, you can either create 
you can either have a state of small angular momentum or a state of large angular momentum i. And in the case of a small angular momentum, what happens is that the polarization iz can only go between minus i and i. Um, and so in the extreme case where, say, you just have i total i equals one half, even at very weak nuclear polarization, you have this strong uh, sideband asymmetry. In other words, um, you can sort of um, um, partition your, um, your phase space here between the asymmetry commensurate polarization and the mean field polarization into different parts, um, parts where you know, the asymmetry is larger than uh, what you would expect for a classical state and another case in which the asymmetry is lower. And really uh, the fact that in our data, we are here well above uh, the classical line signify, signifies that um, our uh, feedback uh, scheme, like when we, we do this uh, nuclear state preparation, we actually have um, uh, the, the engineering of, of a low I um, qu qu quantum coherences, or in other words, dark state uh, coherences. So that for us was um, yeah, a, a very, very interesting result. And um, to conclude what I have told you so far, uh, we can create a coherent interaction between a single electron spin and a nuclear ensemble. We can sense this single nuclear spin wave and we can resolve you know, the polarity and we can resolve different nuclear spin species. And we uh, have the, you know, we can prepare many body coherences and we can sort of prepare um, a state of low total angular momentum. Um, however, the, the thing that we were kind of expecting on this platform is that the coherence of this electron nuclear exchange, in other words, our gate fidelity is limited. And um, now I will explain, tell you a bit more about that and how we are working on sort of the next generation of electron nuclear interface, which um, is using strain-free gallium arsenide over all gas quantum dots. So the, the, you know, the in-gas uh, over gallium arsenide quantum dots is sort of the most established uh, quantum dot system. It was the first one uh, ever grown. And really the growth uh, was successful because indium arsenide has a higher lattice constant than uh, gallium arsenide. And so what happens is when you start depositing um, a layer of uh, indium arsenide over gallium arsenide, you create, first of all, a, a, you know, a strain la layer of indium arsenide, but spontaneously this, the system kind of decides to form um, these quantum dots um, to minimize the, the elastic energy. And so you have this spontaneous strain-driven uh, a process um, which, which allows you to form a quantum dot. But the net effect of, on that, on, on the nuclear ensemble, is that the strain um, within the quantum dot is very inhomogeneous, and each nuclear spin will have a slightly different energy spin splitting uh, as a result of these um, strain inhomogeneities. And so in other words, the nuclear spin ensemble itself is, is quite inhomogeneous. And so um, one thing um, that we have started uh, working on a few years ago now already is looking at um, uh, lattice matched quantum dots. So here in, in this case, we're looking at gallium arsenide grown in aluminum arsenide. So you see you have uh, a lower band gap for, for gallium arsenide which will allow you to form a quantum dot, but the lattice constant of the two materials is almost the same. 
And the way people grow um, these, these quantum dots are essentially by etching a nano hole in uh, the uh, algas um, layer and then filling it in with, with gallium arsenide. And this growth technique is really something that was pioneered um, in the group of Oliver Schmidt uh, in, since 2004. And over the years, um, you know, there's been really a lot of progress uh, in terms of, of this growth technique. And uh, I want to just point you to this recent paper where they show that uh, they were able to grow structures where they have charge control and very high optical quality on par with the indium arsenide system. And so um, I don't want to keep you too long, but we have also been working on uh, developing uh, these, these um, diode structures to be able to deterministically charge, load our quantum dots with, with a single electron spin. And um, this is the PL map that you see here, where as we tune the gate voltage across the device, we see these steps where we see you know, the neutral state uh, of the quantum dot emits, and then uh, a single, singly charged, negatively charged quantum dot, two electrons, three electrons, and so on. And if we focus on the um, single electron case, um, what you can do is that you can sort of turn on your uh, magnetic field, you split your energy levels in resonance fluorescence, you can uh, easily resolve these four optical transitions, uh, which corresponds to the optical transitions, which are already uh, well known from, from um, our work in, in, uh, in gas quantum dots. And here you have signal at this B field when you're in the co-tunneling regime, so which, which means that you have your electron in the quantum dot that tunnels fairly fast with, with the Fermi C, so that kills your spin initialization. So that's why you, you resolve all these transitions. And in the center here, you have a disappearance of your signal, which signifies um, that in this regime, if you park your laser there, for instance, you shelve your electron spin um, in, in this spin state and you've initialized it. And so working in uh, this regime, we've been able to essentially redo um, you know, the, the spin control that we knew so well from um, our indium arsenide quantum dots. Uh, we've seen uh, spin Rabi oscillation. So here, compared to the results up, up I um, presented before, we kind of went back to sort of um, um, the, the first technique that was used for spin control, which uses very fast picosecond laser pulses, which allow you to rotate the electron spin around uh, the optical axis. And the power of your laser pulse controls um, this angle. So here you, you start from zero pi, you do a pi pulse, which means you have a maximum readout, then two pi, minimum readout again, and so on. And these spin rotations are sort of instantaneous in the lab. And then if you do a spin rotation and you wait for a certain amount of time, then your spin superposition just processes um, in, in the, magnet, the external magnetic field. And you can see that uh, by controlling the timing uh, between your pulses, you can uh, essentially end up on uh, different points in, in your block sphere. Uh, so the timing of your pulse kind of um, controls um, the, the the, the gates that you can use pulse timing to, to, to have the second axis uh, for, for spin control and, and, and have full control over the end of quantum state. So here, these, these, um, this frequency here is, is simply uh, the Lama precession frequency of the electron spin qubit. And I will just finish on um, the spin coherence uh, times that we have observed in this system. Um, so the first stick is when we saw that 
our T2, our electron spin coherence time was increasing with magnetic field. This is exactly what you would expect if the main um, decoherence mechanism is the electron spin, uh, which for us is good news because that's what we want. We want the electron to primarily interact with the nuclear ensemble, not with electrical noise. Uh, so we take that. And then really something we're really, really, really happy to see is that we were able to um, extend this uh, spin coherence using dynamic decoupling. Um, so the, the uh, idea here is that you just send, um, yeah, lo lots of uh, pi pulses to successively uh, decouple your electron spin qubit for ever longer times. And what we saw is uh, a very nice uh, favorable scaling for prolonging the electron spin coherence. So our T2 scales as n to the power 0.75 uh, to give you an idea, you know, it's typically 0.66 in diamond. And in quantum dots, uh, gate defined quantum dots, they have also measured this exponent. So we're really happy to see this in our system. Um, the coherence time we reach are now 10 times the ones that, you know, the state of the art for an optically active spin qubit. And um, that's, yeah, we're really happy that with this result because the fact we see this extension in dynamic decoupling means that the nuclear ensemble has, has a long coherence time, which is exactly what we were hoping to see by switching to this system. And with that, I would like to conclude on my talk. Um, so I've shown you that we can create a coherent interaction between uh, an electron qubit and a nuclear ensemble. We can sense uh, a single nuclear spin wave within that ensemble. We can prepare uh, and detect um, quantum coherences within the nuclear ensemble. And at last, um, we have uh, very nice initial results with an electron nuclear interface with improved uh, spin coherence properties. And that's where we're really hoping to be able to push towards um, you know, quantum memory application. In fact, our theory proposal um, was kind of targeted at this system with the nuclear inhomogeneities that we were hoping to see in this system. Um, to finish, I would like to thank all the people in Cambridge that have contributed to this work, in particular, uh, Noah and Leon for the gallium arsenide results, Johnny for the dark state uh, coherence, Daniel uh, for the quantum sensing of a single spin wave, um, and Emil, who's been our theory support early on to understand these sideband transitions, and um, Gabrielle, who was in the first demonstration of a coherent driving, Dorian, uh, last but not least, who has been around uh, in all these experiments and is now uh, starting his own group at Oxford. So please do contact him uh, if you're interested in doing great quantum dot spin physics. And at last, uh, Mete uh, for, for his support. Uh, and of course, none of this research would have been able, um, would have been a possibility without like great growers. So I want to thank Edmund um, from, from the Free 5 Nano Center in Sheffield and Armando Rastelli for the strain-free uh, QDs. Thank you very much for your attention. Great, uh, thank you very much for very interesting talks. Impressive the, the level of uh, control that you have. Um, let me say to start out with for questions uh, for the way the software works is please type them in the chat uh, and then when I see the, uh, the question, then I'll uh, read it uh, and uh, then uh, Claire can uh, answer it. We have one already from Taihi Kim that says, considering a nuclear magnon could be strongly coupled to electron magnon, is it possible to control the collective nuclear quantum states through spin transfer torque? Question mark. Um, so that's... Kind of a, an interesting question. So the the um, we we have coined our our spin wave modes uh, nuclear magnons 
um, but with with the caveat that there there are um, more an analogous to what people think of define called magnon in atomic physics, i.e., a spin wave excitation within an ensemble, and in that sense, um, there is uh, no dispersion. Um, it's it's yeah, it's really a, a spin wave excitation within the ensemble. Um, so I think for for us, the strategy really because these spin, uh, spin wave modes can't be really transported is really to map them coherently um, back onto the electron and then and then use the electron as you know an interface to transferring that onto onto a photon for for sort of um, um long yeah long distance communication or even short distance i'd say okay uh, uh thanks um again uh, for people to type uh, please type your your question uh into the, the chat uh, i had a question about the way that you make the gallimard slide al gas uh quantum dots and so that that you're i, I think you're somehow etching a very small a uh, divot into the al gas and then depositing. Could you say a little bit more about how, you know, how we can do that and what kind of sizes you can reach? And, uh, sure. and, like and, and also, just for the record, uh, the expert here on who's who's doing all the growth is is the group of Armando Rastelli um, for for these these samples. I mean, and and other growers. Like I've I know very little about growth, uh, but what I I know. Uh, to answer your specific point is the typical dimensions of these quantum dots. Um, and it, in fact, you can uh, kind of see it here, the, the depth uh, of this uh, etched, this etching process is um, typically, uh, you know, five nanometer. Um, and then this, the size here will depend by how much gallium arsenide you deposit. So it means your quantum dot could still be lower, uh, smaller than five nanometer. Uh -huh. uh, and then the spatial extent is typically 15, 15 nanometer. Okay. So it's, it's still a lens shaped, which maybe this graph is, is, is not very <laughs> good at, at showing or this graph either. It's, it's, still, it's still a flat pancake, if you like. Interesting, correct. Um, other uh, uh, questions? Or uh, uh, high altitude, long range, uh, future questions, things like that? <laughs> OK, uh, if not, uh, thanks, thanks again. I think it's very impressive work. And uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be able to uh, talk with you today or to listen to your talk today across the Atlantic. Thank thanks you very, very much. much. I just realized it's spooky because I I forgot to turn the lights on. <laughs> I might have I set them in Cambridge. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks.